It's all in your head. You don't look sick. Your tests are normal. It's probably anxiety. There's nothing wrong with you. Have you heard these words from physicians, family, and friends? If you're someone who has been struggling and swirling through the revolving door of healthcare to find answers about your health, or if you know someone who is going through this experience, then this podcast is for you. Welcome to the Desperate for a Diagnosis podcast with Laura Nozika, a show dedicated to exploring the challenges of living with undiagnosed or rare medical conditions. This podcast explores both sides of the bedside, We will be speaking with patients who have had challenges with finding a diagnosis, along with experts in the field. I am your host, Laura Nozika. Please note, I am not a medical professional, nor am I affiliated with any healthcare, pharmaceutical, or device company. I am an entrepreneur, and I am an independent market researcher focused on helping healthcare organizations better understand the patient perspective. The podcast is not meant to offer medical advice but to merely share the stories and perspectives of podcast guests. Hello, and welcome to the Desperate for a Diagnosis podcast. I'm your host, Laura Nozika, and today I am here with Pam Cusick, who is a lovely lady, and I'm so excited to be talking with her today. A little bit about Pam before we get started. Pam is an experienced market research professional with more than 30 years of expertise in study design, implementation, and analysis. She has a background in public health communications and research and a passion for patient advocacy, which I'm really looking forward to talking about today. Pam earned a BA in psychology from Sweet Briar College and an MA in psychology from the New School for Social Research. She is the past president of the Board of Directors and Scientific Advisory Council lead for the Horses and Humans Research Foundation. Pam is the senior vice president of a company called Rare Patient Voice, and she will tell us all about her company. She has a lot to share with us today and talking about very important things like patients being involved in market research and all kinds of health-related research. And I think she has some intriguing stories as well about patients that she's come across along the way. So Pam, thank you so much for joining me today. So lovely to see you. Thing, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. I'd like to just kick things off with talking about what Rare Patient Voice is all about, because it is a rare and unique, certainly, name of a company. I'm sure folks would be very interested in knowing what Rare Patient Voice is all about. And I know there is a really cool history behind it as well. So tell us about that, Pam. Absolutely. So Rare Patient Voice is 10 years old. We just we're just celebrating our anniversary this year. Congratulations. And, you. and we connect patients and family caregivers. So parents or or um of children who are sick or you know, adult caregiver or adults who are caregivers of their parents, we connect them with research opportunities. That includes everything from market research, so focus groups and interviews and surveys, all the way through clinical research. We have started out with the way that we started out is we go to events. So we would go to the National Hemophilia Foundation Conference or National Sickle Cell Conference and set up our booth and explain what people, what kind of research people would be involved in. And when they sign up with us, they aren't under under any obligation to participate. But if they do, they earn $120 an hour. And so over the past 10 years, we've paid patients over $10 million. Wow. Um, yeah, for the participation in research, which really is, you know, they are the experts in their conditions. So, you know, they know more about their everyday experiences and, and how their disease is impacting them than their doctors do. So getting their opinions and getting their insights is really important. We now are in nine countries. So the U.S. and Canada, and then the U.K., Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Australia, and New Zealand. And we invite patients not only with rare conditions, but with all all types of medical conditions to join our community because there's a lot of there are a lot of clients out there who need to hear from all types of patients, patients with very common conditions as well as very rare conditions. We have since 2013, we've done over 8,000 projects 
and you know involve patients in all kinds of interesting things. Some you know with usability studies, which for your listeners may know what that is, but you know usability studies are things where you might try out a website or you might try out a device to see you know how do you use it and are you you know how do you interact with that. We've you know all the way through we had a client who was doing who created a clothing a clothing line for people with mobility issues and so they wanted to have people test those things out and see what worked what didn't and how they could improve them so there are a lot of very interesting things that that they can participate in rare P- patient voice i know does a lot of cool things and i think for uh, a lot of folks out there who know that i am a moderator i facilitate market research i have spoken with a lot of patients who have come through from rare patient voice and we know, Pam, that patient, we're, we're all patients, right? So I always hate to say, keep saying patients. I, I prefer, yeah, we're just people with a something. Everyone's got a something, a right? Something, right? But speaking of, of patients, they, they want to help. Patients always want to help. And having, being, I feel like on my own podcast, because I certainly have a story as to why I even started this podcast out of my own patient experience and having to advocate for myself for something that's still kind of iffy, but I think we're getting there in terms of getting some answers and it's so hard to get answers. And that's why it's so great that patients want to help and you have a, you're a resource for patients who, who want to get involved in, in research and, and help their own cause and help find answers to their own diseases and and condition. Many years ago, Pam, I used to work for a company that recruited patients for clinical trials. And we would hear a lot of feedback about how certain types of patients or maybe certain cultures, things like that. Some people are just in general, people are really hesitant about participating in research. What do you hear from folks about getting involved in really any kind of research? So I think, you know, COVID did a lot of bad things, but one thing that COVID did was help people understand more about clinical trials. They heard more about clinical trials and, and, you know, the, the different vaccines being tested. So it wasn't kind of as much of an unknown as it was in the past. Um, You know, there are people who are a little skeptical, you know, across all you know, ages and races and ethnicities for, you know, for a variety of reasons. But I think that, you know, the more that they hear about clinical trials and understand that, you know, that's how drugs come to market. That's how, you know, we we get these different treatments and cures. I think, you know, what we find in our community is most people who sign up with us, they want to help with anything. Mm-hmm. So, whether it's an interview or a clinical trial, they will try to, you know, enroll and, and you know, go through the process because they do want to help other people coming after them. You know, there are, there are so, many, you know, so many inclusion and exclusion criteria around clinical trials that, you know, you may have a, a large community of people that kind of funnels down to maybe two or three people get through the process and you know, it's based a lot on, you know, what drugs have they taken in the past and, you know, where they are in their disease journey and things like that. So not everybody can qualify. So getting the word out about clinical trials and how important they are is, 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 you know, a really an important thing for, for manufacturers because they need an, a large number of people to get the statistically significant results they need to move to the, the next stage. One thing, another thing that came out of COVID were decentralized trials. Yeah. So you see a lot of the things that we might have, you know, wanted patients to go to a particular site to do. If those things can be captured at home, if they can be done by a Zoom, you know, there's some parts of trials that are, are you know, being done in the home or at a local site. And again, patients have opinions about that too. There's some patients who feel like, yes, come to my house. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to leave my house. I want to, you know, you to come here and take all these, you know, different, do all these different tests and, you know, draw blood and whatnot. And other people who who I've talked to who feel very strongly that they want to be at a an, an actual research institution or a, a site because they feel like if something goes wrong, 
they want to have, you know, the whole staff there that could help them. So it's very, I think there are very individual differences and it might have to do with the type of medical condition you have and, you know, and how, I guess, how at risk you are for side effects and so on that might impact whether you would be interested in a, in a decentralized trial. But I think that's another part of, you know, what we saw with, you know, during COVID where people were more likely, you know, they were happy, I mean, in some cases, participating in a telehealth appointment. And then other times they really want to see their doctor and be hands-on and have that doctor talking to them. So I think the same is, in, is true for trials. The one thing that, that I know that is also very helpful is there are organizations out there that provide support for patients in trials. And I didn't know that. I really didn't know that was a thing. Um, for, yeah, of course, you know. in what way? So they provide travel arrangements. They, you know, they'll make the arrangements and pay for, say, flights and and hotels and wow. meals. You know, babysitters if they have children at home. I mean, it's quite. I know. I mean, a good example is I have a, a friend who had a. They live in Massachusetts, but she was traveling her child who was in wheelchair to a trial in California multiple times a year. But she had all their children at home, and as a mom, had to figure out how to coordinate all that. There are organizations out there that actually help with those things and help to make that easier because you know it's it is in the the sponsor's best interest. Because if you can get, if you can make it easier for the patient to stay in a trial, so enroll and then stay in for the long haul, you're more likely to have, you know, the numbers that you need to get your, your drug to approved and so on. So it's a, you know, I don't think it's, I don't know how many trials use those services and what, you know, what percentage of, of people have that offer to them. But I think it's a really neat thing and would make it easier for so many people to say, sure, I'll travel across the country four times a year to do this because you're going to help me figure out how I'm going to get there, how I'm going to get a transportation for a wheelchair, not only, you know, to the plane, on the plane, but then to my hotel and then to the site. You know, there are a lot of legs that, you know, you have to really think about when you're, you're traveling sick people to a, you know, to a specific site or, or people with not even sick, but with different challenges, sure. you know, it makes it more complicated. And, you know, if it's not easy for me, I'm going to say no, because my life is complicated as already as it is. Yeah. We almost need our, our own airline for folks who have these challenges that would make things so, so much easier. Sounds like in a lot of ways, our own, it's almost like a domestic travel tourism company almost that that does that type of thing because transportation i know in the past has been uh, an issue for a lot of patients who might want to participate but they just can't get there and of course if they're in a state of you know not feeling well which is most likely the case it's even harder to to get access to a trial Pam, what would you say as far as folks that you you come across along the way? What what do you glean from from people that's kind of a kind of a constant in terms of the people that you that you meet at these different advocacy conferences that you go to or very specific outreach kind of events that that you go to? What would you say is kind of a common thread that that you see? Or maybe not, but what do you see that's typical? That they want so a couple things. One, that they want to share their experience to help other people who might be coming on to the same journey. So if it took them 10 years to get diagnosed and they might be able to share insights that would make it easier for someone else, they want to help. They want to share those insights. They want to be asked. They want to be involved. Don't make decisions about, you know, me without me. And, you know, and so that's, a, you know, that we hear that a lot, that they really do want to be involved and they want to be able to share their, share their voices and their experience. And then, you know, the, I guess for, for a lot of people, and this is, you know, you and I are researchers, but, you know, a lot of people don't know that they can be involved in research. Uh -huh. They'll come up to the table and they'll ask, well, what is this about? And I'll explain it and they'll say, well, why would someone want my opinion? 
which, you know, oh, they don't well. realize the strength and the power and what they can bring to the table. Um, and I think that's a really beautiful thing because, you know, helping them, you know, realize that they're the expert in, you know, in their condition and they have valuable information that can help, you know, people to create better products and services. It's a very powerful thing. And, you know, we have patients who have come back to us afterwards to say, you know, I didn't realize that I had so much of value to say, and it, it really changed how I feel about myself and, and my condition. And, and so, you know, that's a really, a really gratifying thing that we are able to connect people with these, you know, with these opportunities that help them to kind of realize their own value and how they can you know, share and make things better for, you know, either their own family themselves, but other people as well. And that's a really beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. It's really too bad that, that people would think that, well, why would anybody want my opinion about my own experience? Because it, it is so individualized. And yet at the same time, I think a lot of times patients have not so great experiences with the healthcare system. And we hear things like, and, and I'm certainly have heard a lot of comments through my years of moderating and, and now with this podcast with people saying, well, they told me that my tests were normal and you don't look sick. And all of these kind of pigeonholed, marginalizing kind of comments that they're hearing. I even heard from one patient just last week that I interviewed who said, well, you know, I've had these symptoms all this time, all these years, and I keep going to all these different doctors. And I wrote down my notes and I was very diligent and I made sure I looked nice and, and you know, all these things because she wanted to avoid what I would call some patient profiling also with assume, assuming a certain, you know, demeanor or persona of her. So she made sure she looked nice. She was all buttoned up with her, her questions and her story. And she said, I felt like I, I had to make sure that the doctor would like me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it's interesting when you hear these stories and then to hear that that some patients say, well, why would they care what I have to say is is really disheartening. And and luckily, you've when you and your company have have a, a resource and an outlet for those folks who who do want to tell the story. And you are kind of on the reverse showing that you use the term sponsors. You know, so that could mean a pharmaceutical company. It could mean another type of healthcare related organization, like a device company, something like that, that you're, you're showing that, that these companies and manufacturers who, who take care of us really do want to, to hear the stories of patients. Right. Well, I think, you know, to your, your initial question, I think that they feel that way because we are trained to listen to what your doctor says. Your doctor says you need these tests. Your doctor says you need these vaccinations. Your doctor, you know, and so historically, you know, it's, oh, my doctor said I should do this. And we do that. Not what do you think, Pam, but, you know, your doctor said you should take this. And, and so I think that is part of the reason that some people don't realize initially that, you know, they have that power and they have that information that the doctor doesn't sit with you. They don't know what happens when you get out of bed in the morning. They don't know that you can't lift your arm up over your head because, and you can't reach the coffee cup because they're not sitting in the house with you. And when you were talking to your doctor for that, you know, 15, 20 minutes, you're not telling them that. You're telling them something else about, you know, your side effects or this or that. But the fact that you can't reach your arm over that over your head might really be very important for one reason or another. Also, that you can't get your coffee, which would be really important to me. Right. <laughs> but, you know, but it might be. Yeah, exactly. exactly. But it might be something entirely different that they'll never know because they're not there with you 24 seven. So I think it kind of comes from that historical doctors know everything and we should just listen to what they say. And they do know a lot, but there's some things that they don't know. And that's where the patient is able to fill that gap and, and, you know, share so that then a, you know, a company who is creating a solution for them 
it can make something that actually works, that actually addresses whatever their their true needs are. Because if if one, a side effect is that it you know whatever you're doing or taking impacts your mobility, maybe that's a really bad side effect that you know I can't I can't do it. I can't do my dishes. I can't do laundry because I can't move my arms. Whatever the those things are, they a company would need to know that because they might no one's going to want to take something that causes side effects that impact their life worse than some other you know other symptoms that they might have. Yeah. What have you seen? So we talk a lot about patient advocacy and being an advocate for yourself. I'll ask this question first. How would you define it in terms of what advocacy is? Well, I mean, it's so advocating for yourself is one thing. And then advocacy kind of groups and organizations would be different. So, you know, patients advocating for themselves is, you know, how you, you know, ask for accommodations, you, you know, at home in the workplace, um, you know, from, you know, to your doctor and explaining that, yeah, this isn't, this isn't just a made up symptom. This is, you know, something that's really happening to me. And so, you know, feeling that strength and power to say, this is, you know, this is my life, here's what's happening. And I'm going to, you know, advocate for myself in terms of making things better for me or for my child, you know, depending on where you are. And then, you know, advocacy groups, I think are, you know, it helps to kind of pull that strength and power together, right? Because you, you know, you have a, a group of people who have that same, you know, have had that same lived experience and can then help you to figure out, okay, well, if it's a, let's say it's a mobility issue, and then here's some things that you should tell your employer and they can help you to kind of give you that support to, you know, make difference, you know, make a difference in your life. Like they also do so much work, you know, in, you know, with lawmakers and, you know, and trying to, to, you know, get bills passed that make life better for patients for one way and in one way or another. So they're, they're kind of different. They're, they're, they're different. They're different, but they're the same. You know, the end goal is to make things better for patients. And I think that, you know, for what an individual can learn from those advocacy groups is how to continue that in their personal life so that if they have a need, if they have a, a medical condition that, you know, requires some, what I, I mean, can't, can't think of a million things off the top of my head, but you know that you're working from home. But because of this condition, you need to you know take a break from a screen for you know four times a day. Your employer needs to you know you need to feel the the you know the strength to be able to say that to your employer. Yep, I can I am you know productive worker. I can work all day long, but. I need to actually be, you know, away from the computer for two hours a day. And so I'm going to adjust my work schedule from here to here. And, you know, and most people don't really feel that they can do those things. And so I, think, you know, one of the things that a, an advocacy group can do is to help you to realize that that's your right and that you are, you know, what you, you know, yes, you're a productive worker and do a great job. Just because you can't stare at a screen, you know, you have to have a break, you know, specific breaks during the day from that actually, you know, may make you an even better worker, right? But, you know, if you don't feel like you can ask for that, that can be a real problem. So I think, you know, sometimes those larger groups can help give people the information and the, the strength and the inf that they need to be able to make those changes in their lives. Mm -hmm. We we talk a lot about the patient, but so much of this involves caregivers as well. How does rare patient voice get involved with caregivers also, or or do they have an opportunity to get involved with research as well? Yes, we have we have a lot of caregivers who have signed up with our community. So we have over one hundred and twenty five thousand patients and caregivers, and those are I think it's probably mostly patients, but we do it depends on the the disease. So if it's something that impacts children more so, you know we have a lot of caregivers in a particular community as opposed to to the patients themselves. But you know a lot of times it is you know the 
the companies that we work with want to talk to the caregivers because the patients, you know, has one perspective. But, you know, if you're a child, you're not dosing yourself. You're not, you know, kind of working with your everyday kind of strategies and how you get through the day. And so the caregiver's input is really, really important because you can't get it from the care, from the patient a lot of times. We have a lot of studies for, you know, elderly people with Alzheimer's dementia, and it's the, you know, the child who is their caregiver in a lot of cases, or the spouse who is their caregiver, sharing that information about, okay, well, here are some of the things that, you know, my mom or dad experiences where, you know, like pain points where they could use some help. And that's where we get a lot of, you know, a lot of caregivers, you know, sharing their experiences. And we also have sometimes where it's a situation where they want to do a dyad. They want to talk to the patient and the caregiver at the same time, right. you know, and get both of their perspectives. So it really depends on, on the kind of on the disease area and, and how impacted the patient is to be able to share their own voice because a lot of times the caregiver has to be their voice. Right, right. Yeah, there's such a huge role with the caregiver and, and the family overall in, in terms of how some of these conditions affect everyone around you. So it's not just your con- your condition, it's it's everyone's and how it, it affects them in, dif- in different ways. Some folks listening might wonder, so if I give my information to this company, what do they what do they do with it outside of research or how do they use my information? How secure is it? How would you address that? So we have a we work with a company that called Q1 Tech that has, you know, a very a secure portal where we keep all of the data. It is, you know, compliant with our US laws. It's GDPR compliant to which is a European security laws. And we keep that information in the database and use it to be able to figure. So if a client comes to us and says, okay, we're looking for these patients with this, you know, with this condition and so many patients and so many caregivers, then we can send invitations out only to those people who might qualify. Because as you can imagine, people get, you know, they don't want to get a whole bunch of irrelevant emails. Sure. We all get plenty of irrelevant. Like all of us, right? Right. So they want to get things that are, you know, specifically targeted to them. So we use the information they provide and we only ask for, you know, kind of some basic information. So their, you know, their name, their address, the condition or conditions that they have, their medications, and they optionally can add their race and ethnicity. And then that helps us to then figure out when we have a client who comes to us, who to send those invitations to. We don't sell their information to anybody. We don't share access to our database or to the patients. And if they ever, for any reason, you know, don't want to be involved in research again, all they need to do is ask us and we'll take them out of the community. Um, Yeah, that's why I hope out of this podcast more more people connect with you and, and we'll leave some information about how folks can connect with Rare Patient Voice. But Pam, when we were talking prior to to our podcast time today, you had had a few stories about folks that you had met along the way that maybe took them a while to get a diagnosis and kind of moving along with the the theme of the podcast as well. Do you do you have any success stories that that you've heard about folks who who did find a diagnosis after looking for a while to give a name to their symptoms or maybe someone who was just so frustrated that they're still looking for a diagnosis? What kind of stories have you heard? I mean, there are a lot of people who are still looking, that's for sure. I, you know, on average, I think, you know, in, in one of the, the recent studies that we that we did, it, t- it could take seven to 10 years for some, you know, rare patients to be diagnosed. So everyone who has signed up with us, though, has a diagnosis. So they've gotten to a place where they've been diagnosed, but the, you know, the frustrations and the the misdiagnoses are are quite common, you know, especially if it's a rare condition or or you don't fall into the the right category. So I, you know, I can think of one person who was, you know, young and diagnosed with, you know, or she, they diagnosed her with lupus 
and, you know, sent her off on her way. And, but it didn't quite seem right. And she ended up doing a lot of her own research and found that she had esophageal cancer. Oh, but she wow. didn't really fit fine with a person with esophageal cancer because she was young and didn't smoke, whatever, you know, those different criteria were. And that's why no one diagnosed her that way. And she did her own research. And that's how she, you know, came to that, that diagnosis. And, and, you know, got treated and is well and, and living a, you know, a full life. But I think the, you know, probably the common factor is that people don't give up. So they're, you know, if something doesn't smell right, doesn't seem right, like, oh, you just have fibromyalgia or you just have whatever, oh, don't worry about it. You know, they keep digging, they keep reading, they keep you know, connecting with people and, and, you know, trying to isolate these different symptoms that they have that might actually be something else. And then bringing that back to their doctor. I think I'm, I see more of that now. We talked a little bit about why people wouldn't feel that their experience or their voice was important. But I do think that People are feeling a little more empowered now, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, if there is something that, you know, they've, they've gone to Dr. Google and they've looked up everything and they're like, look, here are the five things that this might be. I don't know if 20 years ago, if you had dug up that information from Dr. Google, but elsewhere, or if you felt as, as comfortable bringing that to your doctor, but now you can say, okay, well, this was in the Journal of Medical, American Medical Association and this was in this, and this was in this. I'd hear these things that, you know, that my symptoms match and bringing those forward. And I think those are the, the cases, you know, there's a lot of frustration when you are, you're misdiagnosed and you're misdiagnosed again, and there are opportunities that are missed for, for treatments and, and preventing some of the, the latter side effects that, you know, if you had been treated now, Mm -hmm. these things might not have happened. And I feel like people now have so much at their fingertips that they they're looking these things up and they're not just idly sitting by like, oh, well, the doctor said I had this. I guess that's what it is. And now I got to just sit around and wait. They're not waiting around. They're, you know, going through and trying to, you know, connect with other people and connect with, you know, journals online and figure out how their symptoms might match up with something that is a little bit, you know, maybe not as common as, as, you know, as their doctor might think. Yeah. It doesn't just fit. Like I like to say in, in my, on my website and my, my video that it doesn't just fit in a, in a box that you put a pretty bow on it and here's your diagnosis, here's your treatment plan. And the patient gets sent on their way. I'm, I'm sure the patient and the doctor would like it to work that way on a regular (laughs) basis. Yeah, but that's, that's not how it works. And you're right. I think things are shifting and that people are more comfortable bringing that other research that they've done on their own with the proverbial Dr. Google and say, what do you think of this? And what do you think of that? And I know that there's a lot of doctors who are probably, you know, subliminally rolling their eyes at that, but they get so, I would like to hope that maybe doctors might look at it as patients helping them as well, because we all know that doctors don't give a lot of time to patients anymore because there's a variety of factors that limit them to the time that they do take with patients. And maybe they're just not in a mode where they can think through all the possibilities or is, you know, the clinical term of, you know, what's on the differential? What what are all the options on the list? Uh, so I, I think that has shifted a lot. And and I think back to what what does it mean to be an advocate? That's that's a lot of it, doing your own research. Right. And I think that's the, you know, kind of the beauty of some of these advocate advocacy groups pulling that information together. Although I will say and in one interesting thing, a study we did a couple of years ago was about patients, how they feel about advocacy groups working with pharmaceutical companies. And one of the questions we had asked was if you do, are you working with an advocacy group? And over 50% of the, the patients and caregivers we talked to said they were not working with an advocacy group. Oh, wow. Which, you know, where we sit today, we think, oh, well, of course, everyone works with an advocacy group, but that's not true. You know, they're, 
And, and we asked why, if they weren't working for it with one, why were they not? That they didn't either know about one in their disease area or they didn't have time to, you know, go and look for one. So, you know, it was, it was striking that, that people were not necessarily availing themselves of that, you know, the information that a group might provide. Because I think, you know, when they're pulling together, they, I mean, the advocacy group, they're pulling together research and they're pulling together, you know, a registry and some natural history studies and information that can be beneficial to, to patients. Those patients who are not participating or not involved, you know, they're doing their own work and kind of could be shortening that process if they knew about an advocacy group. I don't know what the answer is there, mm-hmm. to, you know, to like, you know, get people more engaged with advocacy groups. But I think it's, it was interesting to me because I thought there would be a much higher percentage of people involved in advocacy groups. Yeah. Yeah. And some people might just think, oh, an advocacy group, that's that's a support group where everyone's just kind of talking about their issues and not everyone needs a support group or wants one, but certainly not knowing that it's way more expansive of benefit to to work with an advocacy group just from an information standpoint or advocacy groups who are keeping you updated on what new treatments might be available for your condition, et cetera. So there's probably just a lot of misinformation or miscommunication on what an advocacy does and doesn't do. So probably true. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I think there is there's a lot to be said for your gut and listening to your gut also, like the lady who was diagnosed with or misdiagnosed with lupus and she she pushed for for finding other answers. I know for myself personally, I had a a muscle issue where I had a a head twitch and a muscle spasm on the right side of my neck. And I saw a couple of neurologists and they both told me I had something called cervical dystonia. And the first one wanted to shoot me with Botox. And the second one said, no, do not do Botox. So, you know, and it turns out it wasn't (laughs) Diagnosis to begin oh with. Gosh, wow. I could have been getting Botox injections unnecessarily, but it, but I think if it doesn't feel right or you feel like you need to be getting a second opinion from another physician, in my situation, I think I was on the third or fourth at that point because I wasn't, my gut told me I wasn't convinced that that's what it was. But I think, I think intuition and, and just listening to your, to your own brain is in your own voice is is really powerful too. Yeah. So Pam, what are some of the categories that rare patient voice is really looking for patients to help with market research? Are there some some places that you need more help in than other? I'm sure you welcome everyone, but are there some areas that that need some help? Oh boy. Well, we, we do welcome everyone. It's, we have over 1400 conditions that, you know, that are currently represented. You know, it's every week we get something different. I could, you know, pull up a little list over here while we're talking and it's, it could be, you know, a hemophilia study, hemophilia B. It could be, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of work being done in cancer. So you know, some of that, we get a lot of skin cancers and, you know, brain cancer and things like that, as well as, you know, breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer. One, one interesting thing now that I mentioned prostate cancer is, you know, women participate in research more often than men. So when we have a prostate cancer study, we may have a lot of people we can send an invitation out to. But the response rate is much less. So we can always use more prostate cancer patients because, you know, we do get a lot of a lot of requests for that. And we have, you know, we it's harder to find the patients who want to share and, and you know, discuss their stories. We also have and this is not disease specific, but we do get requests for people who use feeding tubes, as an example, or wheelchair. Mm-hmm. So it's not always by disease. It might be by some other, you know, some other specific factor. Just, you know, quickly looking at this list, you know, multiple sclerosis, ulcerative colitis, primary immune deficiency. And there, I mean, it, the list every week changes. Oh, is that on? Yeah. It's, you know, where there are products being developed and, and there's work in a specific area, we'll get a lot of requests for those specific disease areas. And then you know, next year or next week, it's something entirely different. 
Yeah. Real quick, Pam, let's let's talk about men for for a minute here. So what is it about the men who are less apt to participate in, in research? I think it's just women are, I mean, this is going to sound completely sexist, but, you know, that women are used to sharing about their conditions and, and kind of sharing a little more openly about, you know, medical issues and sensitive issues. And men are not as maybe as comfortable or don't want to share for one reason or another. So I think it's, you know, I think it's just a, a, and of course there are plenty of men who do want to share and there are plenty of women who are like, no, thank you. I'm not talking about that. So there are, you know, there is variability, but I just think in general, women just share more and, and, you know, it's in the caregiver part of it. It's also women are more often the caregivers of a parent or of a, a child who is sick, not to say that the dads aren't involved because they are, but a lot of times it is a mom who is signed up as a caregiver of a child with a, a genetic condition or a, a you know a, a childhood issue. But I just think it's I think it's just our maybe your your nature that you're, you know, we talk about women talk about things. We talk about, you know, breast cancer and a lump and, you know, and you know, things that that impact us pretty openly with you know with our our colleagues our friends and and things like that and i don't know that men are necessarily as apt to talk about things like that as much there are a lot more commercials right now on you know that you see for like erectile dysfunction and and things like that which i think is trying to get men more comfortable talking with talking about issues but you know i mean i think that women are just maybe it's just more common for us to do it. Yeah. We tend to be a, a chattier bunch either either way, but I think it's we we like to help solve problems too. I think that has a lot to do with it too. And help each other. So I I would hope that more men would consider being a part of research because there's so many conditions obviously that affect them as well, you know, even beyond something very specific to to the male anatomy, I guess you would say. Mm -hmm. uh, so hopefully more will participate. So Pam, tell our listeners how they might be able to get involved with Rare Patient Voice and get their name on your list and have an opportunity to maybe participate in a research study. This would be for market research. Do you recruit for clinical trials also or just yep. market research? Yeah. Market research and clinical trials. Okay. So they can go to our website, which is www.rarepatientvoice.com. And there's a link that will say sign up and you can click on that, add your information. We'll have a, a team goes through and, and, you know, adds that to the database, make sure everything is, you know, in there properly. And, and they'll send you an email to confirm, you know, you to confirm that you signed up just to make sure that's not someone else trying to sign up in your name. Mm -hmm. And then when we have a study that is matches the, what you've signed up for, we'll send you an invitation and off you go. Yeah. I've had some patients ask me, well, what are you doing with this information? And will we find out what happened with it? I've had some patients ask me that question. Did they ever ask you that question? So yeah. most of the studies that, you know, that we're involved with, we do, it's not our data. We're not collecting the data ourselves. So it's, it's very uncommon to get the results back, unfortunately, but we do several studies internally every year and just to keep people engaged, because as you can imagine, not every condition is being, you know, it has something in development at this time. So we want to make sure that people stay engaged and interested and we share the results of those studies back with the patients. Ah, that's so great. They can, they can get some of that information. And we do also share, we have a newsletter that goes out once a month and we'll share a little bit of, of, you know, research that we've done so that they can see where, how their voice makes a difference and what, you know, what kind of, you know, yeah, I participated in this and I want to know if everyone said what I said. And, and so they do get that. I'm sure there are, you know, there are, there may be clients who do, you know, share results back. And I know in clinical trials, there are people who want to be able to, you know, they want to know, you know, I participate in this, what happened? And, you know, so that's really up to the trial sponsor or to our client to share that information. But a lot of times it's proprietary and they don't, 
you know, they're making decisions about things moving forward, if it's a market research study, or, you know, maybe some other other decisions based on that information. But it never hurts to ask. Yeah. You know, you know they might send you they might send you something back. Yeah. Well, I love you guys and everything that you're doing and your mission and what you're looking to accomplish. Pam, thank you so much for being with me today and having our listeners learn more about research and getting involved. And I will make sure that where patient voice information is in the show notes so folks know where to contact you. Thank you so much for being with me today. I so appreciate it. Terrific. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate your your time. Oh my goodness, that's a wrap on another compelling story. Thanks for listening to the Desperate for a Diagnosis podcast. If you would like more information about today's guests or to find out more about Laura, me, go to desperateforadiagnosis.com. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow show updates and healthcare news on the podcast's Facebook page. If you would like to be a guest on the show or if you have any questions, advice, or suggestions for our guests, please email me at lauramarie at desperateforadiagnosis.com.